questions, but not a lot of time. So if you have some questions afterwards, hopefully we'll have time for, for questions afterwards. So with that, uh, help me welcome you again to Thanks a lot, Jeff. I'm really pleased to be here. I uh, moved to Kelly when I got over here. My office used to be in Bar Hall, and I taught classes in TNA. Uh, so, but coming over here today, I got lost trying to find this ring. <laughs> <laughs> There's no length of this place to find it. But I'm very pleased to be over here and. Uh, for sure. Okay. And uh, I am excited that you guys are interested in this topic. It's a topic that I'm very interested in as well. And um, this talk is based in part on a paper um, I presented uh, some time ago at Tuskegee University. And the question was, how do we both ethically and sustainably feed the food insecure? And so I'm going to share my thoughts on that. And hopefully there'll be uh, interesting questions and time for questions and answers throughout. I like to sort of hold the questions as I get through this, uh, and then um, we'll open it up for questions, okay? So I'll talk a little bit about my personal interest in this topic. We'll talk a bit about world population growth and food production, and specifically about food deserts what are food deserts, and I'll provide uh, a resource tool. If you're interested in this topic and want to learn more about it, uh, there's um, an online uh, resource called the Food Desert Locator that I'll make available to you guys. And then um, i like to spend a little time talking about alternatives to this sort of development um, path that we're on. And uh, we'll talk about two development paths to agricultural development, and I'll provide a couple of examples from my research and work. And uh, some of the research findings, once we find this information, then what do we do with it? You know, what are the next steps? So part of that is taking what we learn from this research to be able to influence decision makers and policies to perhaps change and move us in the direction that we would like to go. All right? So, and as I said, questions and answers to follow. Well, I was just recounting to uh, Dr. Zender, uh, I have a three-tiered appointment. Uh, when I came to Clemson 10 years ago, I was uh, in the College of Agriculture in what was then called the uh, Department of Applied Economics and Statistics. As you heard in the introduction, I'm a Clemson alum. I uh, my program I was in as an undergrad was uh, agricultural economics and rural sociology, and it was housed in Bar Hall. So essentially, I came back to the department that I started in uh, uh, many years ago. So when I came back 10 years ago, my appointment was a three-tiered appointment teaching. I'll talk a little bit about uh, my teaching. Research, research interest, um, community and rural development. Uh, rural entrepreneurship, and sustainable agriculture. All right? So those are keen interests of mine. And in part because we're here in South Carolina, and South Carolina is a rural state for the most part. Outside of Greenville, Columbia, and Charleston, the rest of the state is pretty rural. All right? So it's very, uh, it's very relevant to what's happening here. And so my third tier or leg to my appointment is outreach. Uh, I'm an extension specialist, and I'm affiliated with the Sand Hill Research and Education Center in Columbia. Okay, and this is, have folks been down to Sand Hill? This is the photograph of uh, the research center there. So interestingly, when I started 10 years ago, um, I was hired uh, w with what was then called the Clemson Institute for Economic and Community Development. So interestingly, Sand Hill Research and Education Center has been in Columbia for since the 30s or 40s, and they were doing agricultural experiments on peat trees primarily. Well, over the years, and by the way, it's on Clemson Road, all right, on Clemson Road. I used to pass that sign driving from South Carolina on 20 and Clemson Road, but never went on until I got the job. And then, so that area was very rural at one point. They were able to do those agricultural experiments out there. Well, over time, 
Columbia grew and expanded, so now it's very residential out there. And so the residents started complaining about the use of chemicals and all those kinds of things for experiments out there. And so when we came on, there were a couple other colleagues who came on about the same time I did 10 years ago. Clemson sold off a portion of their land across the road for Sand Hill, the shops at Sand Hill, if folks are familiar with that. So Clemson used to own that property where the shops at Sand Hill are. But now the, the research center is just across the road. All right? So those are some of the changes that are taking place in agriculture and in rural areas. All right? So I'm not sure if you have been paying attention or not, but the world is growing if you haven't. So um, 2016, the world population is about 7 billion, and it's projected that the population will reach 9.6 billion by 2050. That's a 37% increase in just less than 30 years. Okay? All right? So uh, or just a little bit more than 30 years, 34 years or so. All right? So we're certainly growing. So the question then becomes, how are we feeding all these people as we grow? And we can see the impacts of this growth, uh, the impacts on the environment and those kinds of things. I mean, we can just see it right here in Clemson in terms of Clemson's increasing its size. We're building many new buildings, new uh, infrastructure is needed, all those kinds of things, certainly impacting as a result of all this growth. All right. Well, in addition to the growth, the population growth, world food production has increased. All right, so we can see the graph here, and we can see that um, total um, food production since 1960 has gone 3.1 times, uh, you know, uh, what we're able to produce between 1960 and, and 2010. Uh, population at the same time has grown um, since 60 to uh, 2010 as well, we see, you know, uh, over two times the size, okay? So as a result of that, then we are having pressures um, being able to feed the world population, but there's not just not enough uh, food being produced. There are a number of other issues involved in that as well. So we'll take a look at at that in terms of this. Well, with the growth and with the increased food production, it has come at a cost, a cost largely to our environment. And we have um, farmland expansion, and in part, farm size is certainly increasing. All right, so we have fewer, smaller farms but the farms we do have, fewer farms, but the ones we do have are much larger in size, all right? So with that large size, then comes this sort of intensive increase in how things are produ uh, produced, all right? So in a large part, this he heavy use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, or what is in large part this increase in the amount of production, all right? So it's gotten us to those numbers in increase in food production to a large extent, all right, this heavy use of chemicals. So as a result of that, um, the natural ecosystems are having a difficult time being able to deal with all this extra pressure that's being put on, on it. So as a result, uh, and we can see it in um, many things that are taking place today in terms of the pressures that we put on the environment, all right? Some folks would argue that, you know, the climate change, these different climatic patterns that we've seen more recently is a large result of much of this uh, pressure that's being put on the environment and extending beyond the environment's capacity and how we're using it, okay? So um, interesting, the last bullet uh, regarding uh, natural fertilizer. Half of all the natural fertilizer used has been used um, in the, just the past two decades. All right, so we can see this sort of exponential increase in our use of many of these um, methods.
All right, so despite all this food production, there are a number of people, a large a number of people in the world who are still food insecure, not sure where their next meal is coming from, the next healthy meal, I should say, okay, the next healthy meal. And it's not only just in developing countries, but the photographs depict that this could very well be the case um, in many small towns, communities around. I mean, this photograph here could be 123 uh, Clemson, all right, with the fast food chains and all that. Um, so food insecurity is not just happening in the developing world, but in many other places uh, around that you may not suspect, but certainly that uh, is taking place. So, this question about food deserts and lack of healthy food and people being able to access uh, foods that are available. So, this idea of food deserts uh, refers to the degree to which individuals live within close proximity to a large food, uh, supermarket or a super center. Okay? And the, um, so in an urban place, often they would think about one mile, all right, to being able to get to a supermarket or a large super center. And then in a rural area, 10 miles. So why do you think they're asking about uh, why this presence of a supermarket or super center with, refer with regard to access to uh, quality food or any thoughts? Fresh produce. All right, so fresh produce. All right, so you're more likely to be able to have that available at a supermarket or a super center, okay? All right, so one of the things about these food deserts is choices are limited in food deserts. Types of foods that are available, like the fresh produce, oftentimes you won't find it available, all right? So what you will find available is a large number of convenience stores and um, small grocery stores. All right, so just you know, think about the yeah, the, the the store down the street. I mean, so what about the fresh produce? What do you find um, there at the store down the street or the corner store? Bananas and apples. Banana for two for a dollar. <laughs> exactly right. And you don't know how long they've been sitting there, you know, and so how fresh they are. So you, access. So. Not very many choices with regard to fruits and vegetables there, all right? And food desert residents must travel long distances to access quality, low price groceries. So what is it about those um, convenience stores and the bananas, two for a dollar? Well, you go to Ingalls or Publix or some other place, you can get a bunch of bananas, 59 cents a pound or 48 cents a pound, something like that, all right? so. It's traveling long distance for access to quality and lower prices, all right? And we mentioned less likely to have fruits and vegetables there. And it's not just the fast food restaurants. Also, there are a number of uh, full-service restaurants where you don't necessarily have access to quality food as well, all right? And some of those you can find in food desert uh, counties and communities. Okay, so this idea about lack of choice. So then residents in those communities, they do without, or they have to buy, purchase what's available. All right, so this lack of choice is a big issue when we talk about food deserts. So I think we're very spoiled here in Clemson, all right? So Clemson without the students of about 15,000 permanent residents here. So if you would compare Clemson at, with 15,000 residents with other towns of that size, Clemson has a plethora of grocery stores, supermarkets, all, many of them within walking distance, all right? To, to where you are conveniently located, I should say, all right? And we'll get at that a little bit. All right, but if you were to compare it, not very many other places 
uh, of Clemson size would have the choices that you guys have or we have here in Clemson, okay? Let's see. So, um, so then we can look at sort of the food desert populations and sort of demographic characteristics of people living in those areas. So that would, uh, could also suggest to us why perhaps Clemson looks a little bit different than, say, other places the same size with the amenities that we have here that other places similarly situated uh, don't have, okay? So oftentimes in food deserts, you were talking about a higher percentage of poor, lower medium family household incomes, less educated, and higher rates of unemployment in those places, okay? So then that could very well suggest to us why those choices are sort of low in terms of the grocery stores being wanting to situate there. So like a Publix. Would you, would you likely find a Publix in an area like this? Not like. So you announced you're going to increase your enrollment. Oh, well, then they build one. Yeah, yeah, sure. But I mean, Clemson, yeah, sure. Once they said that, the enrollment plus, I mean, it's not the less educated here the unemployment rate is lower here. There are a lot of things going for Clemson that many other places, but you're right. Once they, but prior to Publix, we had Ingalls, Milo, even before they came. Hmm? Food Lion, yes. But certainly when, and we see the development all around town and there are gonna be even more. Uh, the Walmart just opened the, their, super, their um, neighborhood market, okay? That's the interesting story, uh, the, the neighborhood market. Uh, maybe, Jeff, 15 years ago, Walmart wanted to locate in Clemson, and the folks, you know, rallied against Walmart. So what did they do? Three miles down the road, they located Walmart. But they didn't lose sight of Clemson. They did not lose sight of Clemson. In my um, intro to rural sociology class, maybe two years ago, we had to, um, yeah, the local, I guess, manager or um from Walmart, this Walmart to come to class to talk about um, the Walmart here. But essentially, all the growth, they really wanted to get into this market, okay? And especially, you know, all the students, they, they were right there in the heart of where all the students are located, you know, and um, so they succeeded, even though 15 years ago they weren't able to locate the large superstore in Clemson. They're now back with a scaled down version of it, okay? What do you think, James? Um, I'm not sure what changed. I suspect that, well, the, the idea of it being a smaller store and it's going to be limited to this uh, neighborhood market and, you know, there. I think that was probably part of that. What? Well, the actual super centers do have the, like, the correlation with rising crime. <laughs> yeah. Especially property crime. Mm -hmm. I remember um, there was a lawsuit filed against this back home in Houston, the neighborhood of Victory Lakes. They opened up this area to be a shopping center. The one thing they're going to want was a Walmart Super Center. Mm -hmm. Opened up a Walmart Super Center, and the actual crime rates in the whole subdivision area spiked like 300%, and they actually won a lawsuit against the developer and Walmart. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, no, that's so part of me inviting the, this representative from Walmart to come to class because we in my class had looked at this um, documentary called um, Walmart, the high cost of low prices. <laughs> okay. So, um, but to sort of give a balanced perspective, then I wanted him to come and I had some additional readings about how Walmart is trying to invest locally and those kinds of things, you know, buying, supplying locally and all, because they had gotten a bad rap about that, or at least there's been a lot of opposition to Walmart. And in that video, they talk about not having security cameras at Walmart and all this kind of stuff and some of the issues, crimes that take place there. So, but I suspect it was the downsized, scaled down version of Walmart that sort of, um, yes, sir. Another issue that's on a pretty big road, the right. original Walmart was going to be put on a very small road that went to residential areas and traffic and the truck traffic. 24 truck track. Sure. Because if I'm not mistaken, it was there where now the Lowe's is. Yeah. 
right. originally planned to be where Lowe's is in Clemson. Yeah. Okay. And also there's a, a large wall that was going to be, be built, a retaining wall, and it was going to permanently cast a shadow on the neighborhood. There's a neighborhood where one side of the street, the sun would literally never shine. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So those are some of the reasons perhaps they were more willing to consider a scaled-down version in a different location in the city of Clemson. Okay? Great. All right. So this is definitely, um, you know, the characteristics of the population has a lot to do with the lack of choices that the residents have. So as a result of fewer choices of the types and access of the foods that you can get in these areas, certainly poor diets that folks are dealing with in food deserts. And as a result of that, all right, so for instance, um, they're less likely to consume five or more servings of fruits and vegetables, all right? And there are a prevalence of chronic diseases in food deserts, all right, chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, and stroke, all right? So that's all have to do with their sort of lack of choices and the types of foods that are available in their neighborhoods. So the first lady, I'm sure you all are aware, one of her throughout the, her, um, the Obama administration, she's been interested in healthy foods especially for young kids, okay? And so um, out of that initiative have um, come some resources to look at um, uh, access, especially in uh, low-income census areas. And part of that is um, making available information about um, food deserts. There's this online um, resource uh, regarding food deserts and access and so there's a map, mapping tool there, and then you can click on and get information about the demographic information about the population living in, the, in that area as well, all right? So it's down to, I think, the census track, track level, all right? So this notion that we are dealing with sort of the aftermath or dealing with uh, some of the issues that come about as a result of food production and demands on the environment. Well, we can think about this in a couple of ways. One, sort of the conventional industrial agriculture model versus a more civic, sort of sustainably minded agriculture model, okay? And um, <clears throat> the corporate model would think about nature and think about it in terms of the resources, the natural resources are for us to use. That's what it's about, for us to use and to consume, all right? The natural resources are there for our use and consumption. And the primary emphasis in this corporate ag model is on Speed, quantity, and profit. It's corporate industrial ag model. Speed, quantity, and profit. One way they're able to do this is through this notion of a standardized production system. So one of the things about the McDonald's, or we take Walmart, for instance. You can go to Walmart just about any place, and the products, the same products are there wherever you go. It's sort of a standardized model. All right? McDonald's, that's one thing that people like about McDonald's. You can go to any McDonald's, any place, and the Big Mac is the same. All right? So they've standardized this process. And the and, and way they have done that is sort of this idea of integration, corporate integration from production all the way through the end. So a lot of these corporate farms, McDonald's will contract with farmers to produce the beef. In some cases, they'll own their own farms, so they're standardized, standardizing their production processes, all right? So you get a standard product, and it has the quality, they, you know, the quality 
that they want or the standards that they want. Let me just say that like that, the standards that they want. It has that, okay? And um, so the idea is this mass production, the quantity, and then uh, at the lowest cost to increase their profits, all right? So um, again, we talked earlier about production using chemicals and that foods are highly processed. Uh, nutrient fortified foods, all right, this use of monocultures, all right? So that's this corporate industrial agriculture. Well, another way, an alternative to this would be what you guys are studying in this class, I mean, in terms of sustainable agriculture and sort of civic-minded agriculture. And here are some characteristics of civic uh, agriculture. Farming oriented towards local markets. So instead of national, international production for international and national markets, then the focus is on uh, local markets, okay? And often you would think that agriculture would already be seen as an integral part of rural communities, even in this model over here but that's not necessarily the case. They are less concerned about the communities per se, but more about production and again, with this idea of profits and quantity. So communities are very much interchangeable in that sense. They aren't necessarily, one community is no different from the next, so they can pick up from where they are here and go to another community. All communities are interchangeable, you know? So that's, they aren't necessarily. In sustainable agriculture, civic-minded agriculture, farmers are much more concerned with high quality and value added, and less so with, you know, um, least cost production uh, and the highest quantity yields. All right. Unlike corporate agriculture, production is at the form of more labor-intensive and land-intensive, as opposed to land-extensive where they're building these larger farms, all right? So we're gonna use what, the land we do have more intensely as opposed to, uh, and less capital intensive. So McDonald's and the big industrial farm, they, uh, corporations, they can put in lots of capital to be able to have these large yields, all right? The farm equipment, all the stuff that goes into capital intensive, we just throw money at it and we can increase our yields, all right? Whereas uh, civic, sustainable-minded agriculture, less so. Uh, and let's see, one of the other things here, um, more reliance on local specific knowledge. Again, that's not treating every community the same. Here, there's something unique about this particular community and the produce that's produced there, as opposed to, say, um, what are the best management practices uh, worldwide, and then we'll just apply them here, and that's what we should get, okay? And of course, um, this notion of producers forging direct market links with consumers, as opposed to national markets, international markets, where you don't necessarily know the producer. It's just in a bulk of things that ship from wherever to where. To, uh, so this idea of and we can see examples of that. Examples of that include um, community-supported agriculture, the CSAs. Folks familiar with the organic farm on campus and the CSA there, all right? Also, you pick operations. So these are bringing consumers directly to the farm. They get to know, they know the farmer. Uh, they see how production takes place. And so this is, again, these direct market links with consumers as opposed through wholesalers or middle uh, men, okay? So now I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about um, a couple of examples of um, more sustainable, civic-minded agriculture moving in the direction of uh, that as opposed to uh, <coughs> corporate uh, model. So um, with a number of uh, colleagues, uh, a couple of years ago I was involved in um, a project uh, 
sponsored by the Low Country Food Bank in Charleston and uh, Clemson. So are folks familiar with food banks? And um, sometimes on campus you'll see boxes in there asking to have a food drive and you can put some things, uh, canned goods or some other things in the boxes and it'll be donated to a food bank or a food assistance organization. What yes. Is food okay. All right, so a food bank is um, an organiz a food assistance organization that um, provides oftentimes surplus food. So like you might see a food box here asking for donation, canned goods. So that maybe give that box will be taken and given to a food bank and the food bank will redistribute that to low income households. Okay? So, but what happens in that case is you get these canned goods, they aren't necessarily the best quality. All right? It's high in sodium and things like that. So the Low Country Food Bank was aware of that, so they were interested in improving the quality of the food that their clients received. So the food bank contracted with a group of local farmers to pr uh, produce fresh produce that they purchased from the farmers and redistributed to their clients. So in those food desert areas, they were able to get quality food to the folks living in those areas. All right, so that's what they were interested in. So they were interested in nutritious food to the clients, um, I was interested in this project from the standpoint of the farmers, the small farmers. Um, in this case, the Low Country Food Bank uh, contracted with a group of uh, farmers uh, on St. Helena Island. Are folks familiar with St. Helena Island? Okay. So on your way to Fripp and some other places, you might pass through St. Helena Island on the way to the coast. All right. Well, St. Helena is a little bit different than those other islands, all right? So it's uh, largely an African-American community there, but there's a lot of land pressure on, it's on the water. So developers, you know, would love to have access to that, but um, the farmers there are keen on um, maintaining their lifestyles and livelihoods there and so historically, um, they uh, value the culture there. So we were interested in the idea if you can keep those farmers busy producing, then um, there's a greater likelihood that the monies that they receive will be recirculated in the local community, making those communities viable, all right? Because there's a lot of pressure uh, to sell you know, those lands. So um, we were interested in it from that standpoint. So um, let's see. All right, so basically that's how um, the, that worked. Interestingly, there were eight or 10 farmers that uh, provided produce to the food bank that they redistributed. So that was in Charleston and in the low country that we worked on that. So that project was pretty successful and we thought that, well, there are other um, food deserts around the state. What if we would try to um, replicate this project in other parts of the state? So we uh, uh, reached out to food banks in the upstate and um, we were um, interested in uh, conducting research on the possibility of sort of expanding this idea that was initiated down in uh, the low country to other parts of the state. So the project included surveying local farmers to find out what they were producing, what produce would be available for food banks in the area, what are they growing now, what types of produce and how much they're growing, and what would be their willingness to uh, cooperate with the food bank in this manner. And then also part of the research was we um, surveyed consumers. We were interested in consumer preferences in terms of what would they, what types of food do they want? What would they be willing to pay, their willingness to pay? Would they be willing to pay for a locally grown food, produce, and those kinds of things, all right? So that was sort of part of the, the research. And So 
So what motivated our interest in the upstate and expanding the project initiated in the Lowcountry to uh, other parts of the state was that these were some of the findings from the Lowcountry Food Bank study. Those farms increased their profits, they increased their crop yields, and they improved the quality of their uh, products. So we were interested in scaling it up. And so we reached out to uh, several of these. There are several food banks in the upstate. Golden Harvest is, uh, they have an office in Pickens. Um, Second Harvest Metrolina Food Bank in Cherokee County. And the one we ended up working with was Harvest Hope Food Bank in Greenville. Okay. One of the things about the uh, food banks is they already have a distribution system. So for farmers, you know, farmers, in order to get their products out, they have to take them to market, to a farmer's market, or they have to take them wherever. Well, the food bank would come and get the produce from them, and they would distribute to the, their clients. So they already had a distribution system in place. So that was one of the things that was attractive to, to farmers uh, from that standpoint. Let's see. So, let's see. So, uh, and with regard to food deserts, all right, so we found that participating agencies change their food, uh, their purchasing behavior. So, when we're talking about agencies here, we're talking about food assistance uh, organizations that would come to a food bank to get produce for clients in their neighborhood. So some, oftentimes it might be a church that will have a kitchen or something like that that folks can come and get produce from those locations. So when those agencies, organizations came to, um, uh, if they were purchasing produce or coming to the food bank to get produce, they were making healthier choices in the types of produce that they were available. So these were additional choices. Now, they have the choice of not just taking the canned goods in the can, the high sodium. Now they have choices for fresh produce, and they were beginning to select those items, making those items available to these food desert populations. All right. So, and you can see the types of things that they were doing. So it seems like it, so it was increasing access to nutritious foods for clients. Also, we learned about the desires of consumers, the kinds of things they wanted. Also, a sense about their demand for local produce. What are the kinds of things they want? What would they be willing to pay for um, those products? And then, in terms of who's interested in locally grown products and what products were available in the local region. All right. So. So once we're armed with this information, then in order to be able to sort of change or to help motivate us to move from sort of the corporate model, agricultural model, to a more civic, sustainable model, then it's going to be important for us to um, interact with decision makers, policy makers, to try to change policies such that we are moving in that direction. All right, so let's see. So here are a couple of options in terms of uh, moving in a direction. So many rural places, small towns, they're actually dying as people leave those places. So we have to be careful to stem this population loss, this out migration from these places. So in order to do that, you know, we need to be working to uh, prevent these towns from dying, uh, bringing in uh, jobs, promoting the resources that are there to be able to build and to do away with or to stem this population loss. And then a number of other things, shop and buy locally. And we do see that beginning to happen in communities. Are folks familiar with the, um, uh, the sort of the Carolina uh, fresh produce by 
local Carolina produce. So that's uh, a, a movement to uh, promote buying local, supporting local farmers. Improving transportation infrastructure. So, you know, this whole notion of food deserts based on how far away is the nearest supermarket or super center. So again, I mentioned early on that we're sort of spoiled here in Clemson. So that cat, the cat bus, how many folks use the cat bus? Okay. Well, most towns of 15,000 in South Carolina do not have a bus system. So you guys, this notion about transportation infrastructure, so you can go to the Walmart in Central, you can go to Publix, or you can go to grocery store in Seneca if you like, because you have that cat bus, you can hop on and go there. Well, most other places, folks, if they don't have their own vehicle, it's hard, they're hard pressed to be able to get there. So the importance of improving the transportation infrastructure, all right? And so here are some recommendations of, um, so providing transportation to and from the nearest supermarket, policies that promote healthy eating, better, better health education, and access to physical activities. Regulations on food and beverage advertising, similar to cigarettes. So, I mean, you know, the label you have to put on the packaging, how they're harmful to your health, that sort of thing. So they're saying, Perhaps we could um, think about beverage and food advertising, you know, so basically some things about that. That has come up in policy. Um, more recently, I guess, New York City and the container sizes of um, soft drinks and those kinds of things. So that's sort of getting at that, that, that idea. Uh, and then ensuring access to sidewalks, bike paths. This is happening. This last bullet, um, Many companies are promoting physical activity and making facilities available to their employees. So they're interested in their profit margins and uh, sick leave days that people are taking out. So they're trying to use these as activities to be able to encourage that. Yes. I know that the Verizon um, corporate place in Greenville has a facility on on their campus to work out. And then they also, just recently my buddy worked for them and they had, a, they did like a 5K mm -hmm. and they got to work a half day or something okay. for a whole day's pay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's um, important to their bottom line. And so they're beginning to look at some things like this. Oh, another thing that, um, in terms of policies. So for right now, most of the agricultural subsidies go to large sort of commodities. So we're talking corn, soybeans, grains, that sort of thing. So why not vegetables, okay? Why not vegetables? Why not um, local, organic, sustainable farm ventures and things like that, incentives for that? So that's sort of the idea of moving in that, in that, that direction. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm making available some selected references and my contact information. Yes. I just wanted to mention that some of you may have heard of this a, a company called Every Table that started out in LA. Huh. And um, Every table. this young guy started the company and their their model is to prepare healthy food, fast food, um, but to make it affordable uh, in that community. Huh. So like what, huh. what they charge the stores in like South LA it might be four dollars a meal, but downtown LA it's like eight dollars. Mm -hmm. We're looking to maybe expand this nationally, I think. And so maybe something to think about is, do you think that model would be, you know, um, something that would be sustainable? You know, can you ethically, morally, whatever, mm -hmm. charge more in one area than another area based on the uh, economic status of that particular area? But it's a really interesting model. They have a website if you want. Any Agricultural economists in the agribusiness folks. I mean, sort of market segmentation. That's what they're, you know, you sort of segment in the market. People are charging different prices, you know, for different things depending on, on that. But this is pretty overt that they're doing that. Yeah. yeah. But it, it happens. 
put it into like the actual description or plan. It's just a certain percentage over at cost to produce because if you're in, uh, it's going to hire you so transportation is going to be higher than if it was outside. And do the same thing, make it fair. Yeah. So one of the things that we found in our research was that we tested this idea of having a label on the produce from farmers that were going to food bank and, and consumers said they would be willing to pay a little extra knowing that part of that, what they were paying would be helping out, you know, uh, communities, food desert communities. Okay, yes. Um, what about like a nonprofit grocery model? Um, I remember seeing a video on Facebook talking about that. Mm -hmm. Strategically placing them in food desert. Yes, I think I was at a, um, Last year, at a uh, South Carolina loan fund, which is uh, the state providing loans to social entrepreneurship and other activities like that, and they were trying that in Columbia. Yeah. Uh, at a, uh, yeah. So I, yeah, I think I don't know if they were. Yeah, I think it was a nonprofit, essentially a grocery store. They were trying trying that model in Columbia. Yes. Do you know if there's any like micro loans or micro lending happening? In this okay. Um, what I do, I think there may be some, but I think there are some individual development accounts that they have. They would give folks incentive for saving. They would match, some folks would match some monies with which, if you put in some savings, it would be matched. So I think through that, there are some individual development accounts at some institutions to encourage that. I think there's some micro lending taking place as well, but it's not as popular as in some of the other uh, developing countries. And in large part, I think because of sort of the scale and the amount that things sort of cost. I mean, like they're lending loans like $250, those kinds of things. It's not, you know, uh, not as much of that going on here. Yes, sir. Um, as far as financial aid is concerned, um, are there any uh, state or federal programs that offer any kind of agricultural subsidies or tax breaks to producers that are selling locally? That's a good question. I think maybe at this, I'm not, nationally, I'm not aware of that, but maybe some state, maybe you're trying to do some things like that. I'm not sure. There are subsidies, but there are grant programs that, or um, projects that are that encourage food access and um, local access to mm -hmm. yes. uh, The trial and rescue market, you can take your food stamps and they'll double them as long as you buy a food box with them. Okay. So you can so, take $5 of food stamps and get $10. Okay. <coughs> so those are sort of incentives? That's a state program that now people are utilizing. They're going to take it away. Ah, uh, okay. Well, good luck. Uh, see the food stamps. I'm not sure the actual like name of the program. Uh -huh. Are you using the resource? I believe it's all the resources. People that run the farmers market. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So one one way of getting access to these fresh fruits and vegetables, there's this EBT system at farmers markets that so you, folks can take their uh, EBT card and use those electronic benefit transfers and purchase produce at farmers markets like the one in Traveler's Rest. Okay. Yes. So is what is Clemson doing? Uh, does it have a role in, in trying to fix this problem? Because I know like the Clemson Extension Sandhill has the farmers market on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, is that a Clemson led initiative or how I think that's more community, but I mean it's there at Clemson they use that space. I mean Clemson is providing in kind support to them, you know, but it's that, that community there. I mean, there are a number of things that are taking place, faculty members that are doing things. The student organic farm is one uh, moving in that direction. The cafe, the Clemson, uh, Clemson area uh, food exchange. All right, so promoting, uh, bringing farmers and uh, consumers together through that. So there are a number of things. I'm sure there are other things that I may not be aware of. Yes? Before, let me just interrupt real quick before since you have to sign the sign-in sheet. So before you leave, so we get all signed up. But feel free to stay and ask. Mm -hmm. yes. um, do you happen to know of any like successful community ga garden projects that uh, might be occurring, not just rurally, but maybe even urban? Urban, urban, yeah. Um, 
There are, I was just, oh, wait, wait, I was just talking to Dr. Zender before. There was uh, one in Greenville. Mill Rivers Farms in Greenville. Okay. Popular, especially in sort of this idea of urban gardening and all of that. Yeah. Thanks, sure. Thanks for your question, sure. Yes. So what if I, um, what am I, uh, the town I used to live in, they opened a cooperative grocery store, uh -huh. and they used an interesting like, funding model, and I wanted to know like, what your opinion was like on the viability of it. Uh -huh. It's like, a, it's kind of a micro loan situation. Okay. There's a community, um, and so, Say person A, they say, okay, I'll invest five thousand dollars. Okay. And they're able to set their terms of interest and their payback period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they might say, okay, four percent, and I'll you know, pay you back within ten years. Uh -huh. The person B says, okay, I'll give you three thousand dollars, but I only want one percent interest. Mm -hmm. We have to pay you back within. Two yeah, right. And so it's all different mm -hmm. across the board, but it works. Yeah. And they, they open the store and it's a success. Yeah. No, I think that's great. In the sense. So, what are some, like, are there any problems with that model? Well, I think it could be. I mean, in the sense that, uh, but the advantage, let me think about the advantages of it. In the sense that it sounds like it's community based. And so then there were people in that local community that sort of came up with that system and there's a lot I suspect that there is a lot of sort of peer pressure within the community trust within the that local community that is driving a lot of the success of it being able to work that's what's been happening in other places many of these micro lending situations where these rotating credit associations is an example of that where by a person would put in whatever amount this month and it, everybody in the circle will put in that amount and then one person will receive that amount. Then next month people will put in, another person will receive that amount. So there's a lot of trust within the community. People know each other and they came together for this purpose. And if you look at the rates of failure, there aren't very, it's not as high as a conventional, all right, in part because the trust of the people and they know each other. So in the sense of that, I mean, they had input, the community had input on how to develop that system. Uh, I'm sure that there are some failures and it doesn't work and there are problems with it, but I think that by being more involved, uh, being community-based, that helps in terms of its success much more than, say, a conventional system. You couldn't necessarily do that uh, conventionally because uh, people want contracts, and legal, all of this, you know, but here it's a little bit set up a little bit different. Not that they don't have some of that, but by the community. There's a lot of paperwork to keep track of the different pay back periods. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably, yeah. I mean, they, they wouldn't do it conveniently because it would it, it'd be too much, uh, uh, too many things to have to deal with that it wouldn't make it worth their while. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I can understand that um, for the food business, mm -hmm. it is like an IT process. That means we put uh, a person is in the food process if he wants to have uh, healthy food. But uh -huh. eating habits can also, uh -huh. how, you, how would you say uh -huh. someone who does not have uh, so, uh -huh. they require to yeah. have healthy food? Right, right, right. So, one of the things. Yeah. One of the things that the food bank had to do, they had a nutrition director that was very much involved. Part of the uh, program included classes and education about, surprisingly, people didn't know how to prepare the fresh produce. So, I mean, they're accustomed to getting in a can and just dump it into, uh, you know, a saucepan and heat it up. But when you get with fresh greens or whatever, what do I do with this? So, there was a lot of education involved in that. And cultural, you know, changing cultural habits and things like that in terms of how people eat and what they eat 
yeah, that, that's, that's all part of it. It has to be part of that, too. You can have all the healthy food there if you want, and if folks, you know, won't get it or won't uh, venture out to learn how to use it, then it's not worth it. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Aaron? Kind of related. I yeah. think you do another environmental justice review. Are you like one last year? Okay, yeah. Um, we are thinking along those lines again. So if we, uh, are you going to still be around? Um, I'm looking to go up, honestly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. We'll, we'll keep you posted. I certainly appreciate your help last time. Yeah. This is a sustainable neighborhood thing tomorrow evening. I don't know. Where, uh, what, it's going to be at the oh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's just a Watt Family Innovation Center from 5 to 7. Oh, it's going to be a okay. discussion kind of thing. Uh, what's the topic? It's, well, sustainable neighborhoods. Oh, sustainable made up neighborhoods. Oh, oh, oh cool. I want the word to go out to the I Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Sure. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, sure.